So this next presentation on the thanks, I got your attention. The next presentation on the uh, star that guided the Magi. This is an interesting aspect of history. It's fun to think about this. And so the question I want to answer is, uh, what was the star that guided the wise men to Christ, the Magi? And this, is, this account is found in Matthew 2. And really what I'm going to do is just kind of go through Matthew 2, exposit it. And um, there's sort of um, three levels at which I'll be working here. There, there's the text itself, which is infallible to the inerrant word of God. And that's not to be questioned. There are things that we can sort of reasonably infer from the text, things that are not directly stated, but it's very reasonable. And then there are conjectures that we can make, and those are as fallible as anything, but the rule there is they have to be compatible with the text. So I'm going to give you my take on that as an astrophysicist and maybe uh, kind of try to get, make some logical guesses as to what this uh, star may have been. So at first I'd like to just read through the uh, text, uh, Matthew, beginning Matthew chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, or if not, it'll be on the, on the screens, and we'll read through verse 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard it, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make careful search for the child, and when you have found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house and saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their own country by another way. Now when, they departed, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. And he arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Out of Egypt did I call my son. Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its environs from two years old and under, according to the time which he had ascertained from the Magi. So let's back up now and just kind of go through these. And I want to give you some background information on this uh, text. And, and just so you know, I'll be spending a lot of time on the first two or three verses, so if you're like, oh, he's only on verse three, this isn't going well. The rest of the verses will go very quickly. But I think, I think it's helpful to get some of the background information here. So uh, this, of course, is during the time of the Roman Empire. So Rome had conquered the world at this point. It was a time of relative peace, uh, the Pax Romana, because Rome had conquered everybody, so there was no, there was no wars to get into at this time. And yeah, that's kind of, a, kind of an interesting aspect of history. Rome allowed, um, the nations that it had conquered to keep, to some extent, their own system, their own religions. It didn't really care about that too much. In some cases, their kings, as long as they then paid tribute to Rome. And so that, that's the context in which, we, in which we see the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem means house of bread, and it's very fitting. I love it when the Lord does things like that, that the bread of heaven should be born in the house of bread. I think that's neat. And uh, that was prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So in the Old Testament, it prophesied that the Messiah, who would pay for the sins of God's people, that he would be born in Bethlehem of Judah. Uh, at this time, of course, Judah is all that's left of Israel. The northern ten tribes, they had been captured and scattered. So Judah is what's left. It's the remaining tribe. Remember, for a long time, the nation of Israel was divided into the northern ten tribes, which were collectively called Israel, and then Judah, and Benjamin kind of sided with uh, Judah, but Benjamin's a very small tribe. Uh, 
And uh, Judah still exists. It had been taken, uh, they had been taken captive by Babylon about 500 years earlier. For, for a period of 70 years, they were in captivity in Babylon. And so that they've now gone back to their homeland. And this is the time in which uh, the Christ is born, the Christ who people had been looking forward to for 4,000 years since the fall of Adam into sin. And God promised that a descendant of Eve, the seed of the woman, a descendant of Eve, would crush the head of the serpent. So this is that spectacular time in history when all this was going to actually take place. So then we have uh, Herod the king. Herod was king in Jerusalem, but not by right. He had bribed his way into power. He was a wicked man. He did not deserve the throne of David. Um, we, We think he's probably not even Jewish. But in any case, uh, he had bribed his way into power using um, the Roman system there. And he was a very, very wicked man, in case you didn't get that from him trying to kill two-year-olds in Bethlehem. Yeah, he's a wicked man, so he doesn't have competition to the throne from a toddler. So uh, that's a problem. He had, in fact, he had uh, uh, one of his own sons tried to poison him. He apparently wasn't a very good father either. And uh, he ended up killing, he ended up executing his own wife and two of his sons. So that gives you a little bit of a feel. Not, not such a great father figure. On his deathbed, he, he ordered that all of the leaders in Israel should be rounded up. He knew he was going to die. He was a slow death. And he added them all imprisoned. And his order was that when he died, they, were all, they would all be executed so that there would be mourning in Israel over his death. And fortunately, that command was not followed. But that gives you an idea of the, the wickedness into which... God has placed his innocent son as a baby. And it's just, it's just, a, it's just a neat, it's just very suspenseful. It would make a great movie. And uh, God knows how to write good stories. And it's not just a story, it's history. It really happened. So that's pretty amazing. Okay, so then we have these magi that come on the scene. And uh, magi, it's where we get the word magic, it's related. These were the scholars of the ancient world. These were the PhDs of the ancient world. And they had their own order. We think they're from uh, the Persia area because uh, magi is the Persian word for priest. So these would be scholars of the ancient world from Persia. And the neat thing about Persia is that's where Babylon was part of Persia. Okay, and so the Jews had been in that part of the world 500 years earlier. And they were there for 70 years. So this kind of gives us some insight as to how the magi might have known about the Messiah. Right? Their nation had conquered Judah and captured them and had them for 70 years. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see a little more of that a little bit later on. So they're the ones that are arriving in Jerusalem. Here's a, give it gives you a map of the region. So you have Bethlehem and Jerusalem. They're only six miles apart. There's actually two different thumbtacks there, but they, they overlap so much, they look like one. And then way over on the right, you have the Persia area. Babylon would have been kind of on the uh, uh, western side of Persia, so maybe not quite that far, but the, the distance between Bethlehem and Persia proper, about 1,000 miles. So that gives you an idea of the trip that these magi made. It was a long trip. Now, I'm going to fly 1,000 miles tomorrow in a few hours. But um, they didn't have jet, jets back then, so that's, that's a little bit different. So uh, the Greek historian Philo described, describes the magi as, quote, men who gave themselves to the study of nature in contempla- contemplation of the divine perfections worthy of being the counselors of kings, end quote. And we do know that they would advise kings from time to time. These were the scholars of the ancient world. And so if the kings wanted to know, if any nation around there, if they wanted to know when, what a particular celestial event meant or, or when to you know, see time and harvest, whatever they wanted to know, they would consult with the Magi. So they were, because they were the scholars. They were wealthy because they were well compensated for their, their counseling kings. And they had their, um, they, they were a mighty people. They actually had their own personal army. Just the Magi had their own personal army with them. So that's pretty uh, interesting. They would have been knowledgeable of all the sciences as much as could be known at that time. Uh, today, we know so much about science. We scientists specialize in you know, astronomy and physics and chemistry. They would have known it all because there was less to know. So they would have known a bit about chemistry, not molecules and atoms, but they did know if you mix this substance with that substance, what the result was going to be. Uh, they knew about motions in the sky, astronomy. In the ancient world, astro- we, we probably think of Saturn when you think of astronomy, rings and things like that. Uh, they didn't know about Saturn's rings. Um, in the ancient world, before the invention of the telescope, which was 1608, in the ancient world, astronomy was all about being able to predict motions and understand motions in the sky. And so the Magi would have been as good at that as anyone could be without really understanding the nature of the solar system. They probably didn't understand it exactly back then. But in any case, they could predict things perhaps like eclipses. 
Uh, it was kind of hit and miss until modern times. Today we can predict eclipses to the second because we, you know, we, know, we understand how those motions work and we have computers that can do it quickly. So, uh, so that's, that gives you a feel for these magi. How many magi? Now we know from the Christmas cards that there were three, right? <laughs> and from the song, We Three Kings, which is a cool song, but they weren't kings and there probably weren't three of them. Uh, we know there were at least two because the word's plural. Magi is plural, so magus would be one. So there's at least two, but there's probably many. There were, because there were many magi, we know that. Um, we know from other literature that there were many of them. We don't know how many made the trip. Did all of them make the trip? We don't know that. Did half of them make the trip? We don't know that. So we don't really know how many magi there were, but most scholars believe it was many. That this wasn't just you know, three guys on camels going through the desert. They probably, uh, there's probably many of them Again, they would have traveled with their own personal army, so they did, they did not have much to be afraid of. They probably rode on horseback rather than camels. The Persians were accomplished horsemen, and if you were wealthy in Persia, you'd have a horse rather than a camel. Camels for poor people, okay? And so they probably rode horseback, and they probably went around the desert. It'd make a little more sense. But in any case, um, one of the other things about Magi, because they were counselors of kings, they could also be called upon if there was a dispute about who was the rightful king. And they had the power to um, decide who, would, who was the rightful king. And with their personal army, they could, enforce, they could enforce their decision. That explains why Herod was troubled. These, these Magi are coming. They have the power to depose kings. They're coming to Israel searching for the king of the Jews, which Herod thinks he is, but they're not looking for Herod. Now we get why he's troubled. Yeah, it makes sense now, doesn't it? It is very significant that Matthew records Magi from the east searching for the king of the Jews and not the Jews searching for their own king. This is an indictment against the unbelieving Israel. Most of the Israelites at this time, most of the Jews, were unbelieving. They were not looking for their own Messiah. A few were. I mean, Christ's disciples were Jews, obviously. But most of the people, the people that should have been looking for him the most, the religious leaders in Judah, they wanted him dead, right? They ended up getting the Romans to crucify him. And so it's a, it's a great irony that Israel, Judea, associated with, you know, that, that, was God, that was the symbol of God's people in the Old Testament, that nation he had singled out as his people. They're the ones that should have been looking for the Messiah. They weren't. And instead, Gentiles from a pagan nation were searching for the child. That's interesting. And that, that's the beginning of a, a real turning point in history because we learn from the scriptures that God used the disobedience of the Jews to bring salvation to the Gentiles, for which I'm very grateful. And Romans 11 talks about that and also talks about God uh, using, God pouring out his blessings on the Gentiles, making Jews jealous so that they would then come into the kingdom as well. So it's just, it's wonderful. God, the way God works, he can even use disobedience to bring himself glory. Not that we should continue in sin, that grace may abound, but nonetheless, God can use even disobedience to accomplish wonderful things. That's something only God can do. So, but at Matthew throughout, Matthew is just a scathing indictment on unbelieving Israel. Each of the gospels focuses on one aspect of Christ's ministry or character, right? And it's wonderful that we get that. Each, each gospel gives us information from a different perspective and, and so on. Matthew focuses on Christ's kingly office as the son of David. Okay, he, that Jesus is the rightful king of the Jews. And so it, it makes sense that he would focus in on that aspect. And he really focuses in on the fact that the majority of Jews rejected their own Messiah, whereas Gentiles from a pagan nation received him. And there's just a lot, you can read a lot of that. You can read, remember the fig tree that Jesus came and, and it wasn't producing fruit, so he cursed it and said it'll never produce fruit again. And it withered. The next day it withered away. And, uh, and the, the Jews got that. That's us, that's Israel. The, the, the king came to receive the fruit from Israel. They weren't producing fruit. He tells a parable in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus tells the parable of the landowner who went away on a long journey and he had his workers working the, the field and he sent back slaves to receive the, the fruit of the labor, right? And what did they do? They beat one, they killed another. Finally, he says, I'll send my son. They'll respect my son. He said, this is the heir, let's kill him. And then Jesus asks the telling question, what do you think the landowner will do? What do you think the master will do when he comes? And they answered rightly. They said, I'll put those wretches to a wretched end. And Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom is taken from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. They got the point that Israel's special status as God's people, 
That's not the case anymore. God has a plan for Jews, but they're not, they're, the church is his people now, the nation producing the fruit thereof. And Jews can be saved, but they come in through the church. So it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting irony. And again, Matthew 23, scathing indictment on the religious leaders. Woe to you, Pharisees, scribes. It's just, it's just amazing. Your house is being left to you desolate. A reference to the temple. The temple represented the presence of God and the fact that Israel was that special nation that, that God had chosen as his own people. He normally referred to the temple as my house. Jesus says in Matthew 23, your house. God's not there anymore. Your house has left you desolate. Matthew 24, where again, not one stone will be left on another that won't be overturned. So, oh, and in fact, it's, the, uh, it's, it's kind of funny to me, the, the, uh, the secular critics, you know, who are all about trying to disprove the Bible, you know, they'll say, well, Matthew, I mean, he's so scathing against the Jews. He was obviously anti-Semitic. He was, anti, he was anti-Jew. He is a Jew. He's not going to be anti-Jewish. That, that makes no sense. So he's just being honest. He's being honest about the unbelieving state of the, uh, the nation at that time. So I think it's, a, it's, it's just an interesting aspect, an interesting irony that the Jews were not looking for their own king and Gentiles from a pagan nation were. And the Gentiles from the pagan nation were rewarded with getting to see their creator face to face. It's pretty awesome, pretty awesome. The Magi apparently had knowledge of the Bible. And we would kind of expect that because Judah had been captured by Babylon about 500 years earlier, okay? And they were there for 70 years. So there was plenty of time to interact and for, to share the, the biblical scrolls with, um, with the Babylonians. The, the Magi themselves had a massive library. No doubt some biblical scrolls were in that library. Maybe all of them. Maybe not. We don't know. We take it for granted because we, we probably all have a Bible in here. You know, I've got several hard copies, but that, that's, that's a modern blessing, it, throughout history, most people did not have their own Bible, and if you did, you probably had maybe one scroll or two. If you wanted your own Bible, you had to hand copy it. There wasn't Xerox machines back then, or even, even the printing press. You wanted to copy the Bible, you had to copy it. So, there weren't that many. But no doubt, the Magi would have had their own copies. Daniel, we know about Daniel. He was uh, a man of honor that lived during the, the captivity, when, when Judah was in captivity in Babylon. And of course, he gained favor with the king. Hey, you can survive a lion's den. That impresses people. And uh, so he had, the king actually appointed him. According to Daniel chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Daniel was appointed king, or pardon me, a chief of the magicians, magi. Daniel, Daniel was a magi. And he was not only a magi, he was their leader at that time in history. Interesting. So I have no doubt that one of the scrolls in their library would have been the one that Daniel wrote. Don't have any doubt about that. So they would have known that one. And as far as I can tell, Daniel's the only, uh, as far as I know, the only prophecy in Scripture that refers to the, the exact timing of the coming of the Messiah. You remember the, the 70 weeks? Those are weeks of years. So 70 sevens, uh, 490 years from the issuing of a certain decree to the, to the uh, Messiah. And uh, yeah, so Daniel actually predicts that timing. And so the Magi would have known the time was right. They undoubtedly would have had that, a copy of Daniel. And perhaps some other scrolls, and I'll, I'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. So, these are the Magi that arrive, and they arrive in Jerusalem, not Bethlehem. That's kind of interesting, because you'll find later they had been, they'd, they'd seen his star. My assumption was, well, they're following his star. Why did they end up in Jerusalem? And then they, they have to ask where the king of the Jews is, has been born, right? And so it seems to me I think this is one of those things where we can make a reasonable inference that at this time, the star wasn't guiding them. It apparently started them on their journey, but at this time, they arrive in Israel, and they, the star, they can't see it anymore. Maybe it had disappeared. Maybe it was just cloudy for a period of time, and they couldn't see it. Maybe they arrived during the day, and you can't see it during the day. But it, I mean, if you think about it, though, if, you, if you'd seen a star, and let's suppose that the star was over, because we know eventually it stood over where the child was, so eventually it's over Bethlehem, right? You imagine a star being over Bethlehem and you're in Persia and you see that star. Let's assume they were following that. You wouldn't be able to distinguish Jerusalem from Bethlehem from that distance. You'd know it's over Israel, but you wouldn't know whether it's Jerusalem or Bethlehem. They're only six miles apart. So assuming when they got close that they could no longer see the star, it would make sense for them to go to the capital city. They're looking for the king of the Jews. Go to the capital city, right? That makes sense. So that's where, in any case, that's where they arrive, regardless of the exact, whether my speculation about the reason is correct. We know they arrived in Jerusalem. 
And they're asking, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? Not if the king of the Jews has been born, or has the king of the Jews been born? Where has he been born? Somehow they knew he'd been born. Interesting. So that gives us a little bit of a clue as to some of the uh, information regarding the star that guided them. But nobody knew. That's another indictment on Israel. They, they didn't seem to know where the king of the Jews had been born or that, or that he'd been born. And so the uh, Magi are probably frustrated at this point. They're asking around, where has he been born king of the Jews? Nobody seems to know. Very sad. We, we take that expression to born king of the Jews. We take that for granted because we hear it so often around Christmas. Do you realize what an unusual phrase that is? No mere human is born king. You can be born heir to the throne, but you don't, you're not actually king until you're able to competently execute decisions. Jesus is born king. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a reference, of course, to his, his deity. He's born king of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east. That's significant that we saw his star, the Messiah's star. Interesting. Interesting. And uh, they undoubtedly would have known the name, the names of the, uh, the, the common stars. The names of the stars are very ancient, the constellations, very, very ancient. So they would have known about Regulus and Venus and Jupiter. That's not what they say. They say, we saw his star. Now, all stars belong to God. They're all his stars, right? He's the father of lights. But it's interesting that they single it out. Whatever this star was, it seems to be specially associated with the Messiah. So that gives us another clue about what this star might have been. It's something that's specially associated with the Messiah. It's his star, not just a star, and they don't use any other name for it. No, no proper names like Jupiter or Venus or things like that. For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And that little phrase there, for we saw a star in the east, that bugged me for a long time because they're from the east. They're from Persia. And so they see his star in the east and decide to go west. Odd, right? That bugged me for a long time. Some people have said, well, maybe it refers to them. Maybe it, they mean we being in the east at the time saw, saw his star. That's a little bit awkward, though. The Greek reads a little more natural that it would be the star that's, that they saw. The star was in the eastern sky rather than um, them being in the east. But actually, if you go word for word from the Greek, it doesn't say in the east at all. The, the, the literal Greek translation would be, we saw his star at its rising. At its rising. And uh, you'd say, well, why? And by the way, two, there's at least two translations, English translations that translate it that way. If, if any of you have the uh, ESV or the, uh, the New Living Version, they both translate it at its rising. So why did the other translations go within the east? Well, the sun rises in the east, doesn't it? And I don't know if you're out at night and you pay attention, but the moon rises in the east. All natural stars rise in the east and set in the west. Hmm. So that would, you know, east is associated with rising. And so that, that was the way in the ancient Greek culture, that was the way you referred to the direction of east, is that that's the direction where things rise, that's the rising. So if you want to go east, go towards the rising. If you want to go west, go toward the setting. Right? If you've seen an old western movie and the cowboys are riding off into the sunset, they're going west. Right? Because that's where the sun sets. So the, that, that phrase could be used literally, meaning at its rising, or it could be used to indicate the direction in which everything rises, namely the east. And normally it wouldn't matter because everything rises in the east. All natural stars rise in the east. Sun, the moon, rise in the east. Planets rise in the east because the earth's going the other way, right? It's due to earth's rotation. I'm gonna to suggest to you that this star was unique in that it rose in the west, okay? And if that's the case, then we should probably stick with the literal translation, for we saw his star at its rising. Okay, but at the very least, that is the literal translation. We saw his star at its rising. And so I'm gonna suppose that when they were in the east, they saw a star rising in the west over Israel. Now that would be significant because all the other stars are setting there and there's one star that comes up and rises. That would get their attention. And Magi would know that. These are, these are the scholars of the ancient world. They knew about astronomy. They knew how things moved. And so my speculation is that if they saw a star rising in the west, that would get their attention. I also believe the star was not particularly bright. That's another thing the Christmas cards get wrong. It's a massively bright star. Everybody would have seen that. Who saw this star? The Magi. The Jews weren't apparently aware of it. 
Uh, Herod certainly wasn't aware of it. He had to ask them when they saw it. He didn't know where it was. So apparently this is something that they noticed that most people didn't. And so a relatively faint star, but none, one that nonetheless rose in the west rather than, uh, rose, yeah, rose in the west rather than in the east, that would get their attention. So that's, again, probably a reasonable inference from the text. But how did they know it was his star? There's a prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, Balaam's prophecy. And my suspicion is that they, they read that prophecy and recognized, that's how they recognized this star as his star. Because Numbers uh, 24, 17, it's a reference to the coming Messiah. It says, I see him, but not now. I see him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Isn't that interesting? It's referring to the, the coming king, the coming Messiah. It's using poetic parallelism, where you say something, you say the same thing using different words, right? A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. Star and scepter go together, both symbols of power, like a king's scepter. Um, Jacob and Israel are the same person, right? Just different name, and the nation that resulted from him. And so these, these are saying that a king is going to come, come forth, a descendant of Jacob, but um, perhaps it has a secondary literal meaning that a star will literally rise out of Israel. And that apparently is what happened. So these magi that are over in the east in Persia, they see a star rising over Israel and they know no natural star would do that. From their perspective, that's west, all the stars would be setting over there. No natural star would rise in the west. You could imagine them, you know, there's a star rising over, over Israel. And then one of them thinking, I've read something about that. I've read something about a star rising over Israel. And so if they had access to Numbers 24, 17, they might have figured it out very quickly. This is, this is the uh, sign that's associated with the Messiah, a star coming out of Israel. So that's my speculation anyway. You can, it seems to fit the text, though. So that's perhaps uh, what they, why they went west. I'm supposing that they saw the star at its rising. It rose in the west, and they recognized that as the Messiah's star, as his star, according to the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17, uh, they, it was very likely they had access to that scroll. It's a very ancient part of the Bible. And so the Jews would have had more copies of that probably than the later material. And then in Matthew 2, 3, we inherit, the king heard it. He was troubled. We understand why now. The Magi had the power and the ability to depose him. They're looking for the king of the Jews, not Herod. Uh, you can imagine why he's troubled. What's disappointing is that all Jerusalem is troubled with him. That's disappointing. Uh, God's people should have been ecstatic that this long-awaited Messiah, they were going to be the generation to see it. I mean, that's, that's amazing, right? I mean, you could imagine it's centuries of Israelites looking forward to the Messiah who would finally crush the head of the serpent. This pro prophesied back in Genesis, deal with the problem of sin. They were going to get to see the Messiah, and they weren't even looking for him. And when they hear about it, they're more concerned about what the Magi are going to do. They're more concerned with politics than the fact that Jesus has come. And we're inclined to indict them, and then we think, wait a minute, we get that way sometimes, don't we? We get concerned about politics, and we forget, you know what? Jesus is on the throne now. He's King of kings and Lord of lords now. Amen. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. Amen. So, yeah, anyway, just uh, we see ourselves sometimes in, in the Old Testament. It's kind of interesting. So, but again, this is another indictment on the Jews at that time, the people that should have been ecstatic about the Messiah coming, they're oblivious and, in fact, troubled. So in, in verse 4, And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he, that is Herod, began to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born. So he's apparently getting some information that he can trade with the Magi, or at the very least, he's just trying to get better informed on this issue. But the, it's clear that he didn't know about it. He didn't know about the king of the Jews being born. He thinks he's the king of the Jews. And so when the Magi come asking about this, he wants to get some information, so he calls the chief priests of the, of the Jewish people, and he begins to inquire of them where the Christ was to be born, and they give him an answer. They know, they know their scriptures. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and they quote uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And by the way, if you, if you read Micah chapter 5, verse 2, you might notice the wording is slightly different. And, and frankly, that often happens in the New Testament when it quotes the Old Testament. Sometimes people ask, why, why is it a little bit different? Uh, well, the New Testament is written in Hebrew. And so Micah uh, chapter 5, verse 2 is, is translating English directly from Hebrew. But they would have been quoting the Septuagint. This is the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. 
And why would they do that? Because believe it or not, most Jews at this time could not read Hebrew. But, most, but if they could read it all, they, they could read Greek. Greek was the common language of the day because before the Roman Empire was the Greek Empire. They had conquered the world and so the international language of the day was Greek. And so that's what the, uh, the, the scrolls that the Jews would have been reading in their synagogues and so on would have been primarily Greek, Greek schools, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. Some people have assumed that because the early church used the Septuagint that it's superior to the original Hebrew text. Well, it's obviously not superior to the original Hebrew text, but it's just what was available and it's what they could read. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, they didn't quote the entire verse. The last part of it says of this Messiah who's going to be born in Bethlehem. It says, his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. I think that's just such a, that's such a cool and powerful verse. This, this coming leader who would come forth from Bethlehem, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. He's yet future, and yet his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. He's always existed. Uh, there are these little tidbits of the gospel that we see in the Old Testament that if, 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 I just wonder what the Jews thought about that because it seems like they didn't quite get the gospel in terms of uh, completely understanding it. They had faith in God and God reckoned to them uh, that faith is righteousness, right? Abraham believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. So the Old Testament Jews trusted in God, they trusted in the coming Messiah, but it seems like they didn't quite understand the, the function of the Messiah, that he was going to die and and, and be resurrected and, and so on. All the information's there, but it seems like they couldn't quite put it together. So I just wonder if this was perplexing to them. How can it be that this future ruler has yet to be born and will be born in Bethlehem, has always existed? And we get that in the New Testament. We understand this is Christ, and he, he's yet to be born as a human, but he's already God, and therefore has always existed from eternity past. So it's a wonderful passage, one of those that indicates the deity of Jesus Christ. And in verse 7, and Herod secretly called the Magi. He's got some information now he can trade with them perhaps because he, he knows the birthplace of this Messiah. So he secretly calls them. He doesn't want it to be public. If it's in public, he doesn't want the Jews to warn, warn them that, hey, our king is actually very wicked. You don't want to go there. So he calls them secretly. And he ascertained from them the time the star appeared. So again, he hadn't seen it apparently or he didn't know when it, when it first appeared in any case. And so he has to ask them that. And it doesn't directly state their response, but their response must have been something like, oh, about a year and a half ago. How do I know that? Because later on, when Herod slew all the children under the age of two, according to the time he ascertained from the Magi, okay? So people think, well, you know, it was just, this is another one of those things the Christmas cards get wrong. The wise men were not there at the nativity scene. This is significant time later. Okay, perhaps a year, year and a half. And I'm assuming that Herod would cover his bases and round up. So the two years would be kind of rounding up. So, but perhaps a year, year and a half was, when, was the time for when they saw, first saw the star to where they arrived and met with King Herod. And he said, why would it take him so long? It's a thousand mile trip. And although you can do that in less than a year and a half, we don't know if it took him time to figure out what the star was. They might have seen it and they might have spent months trying to figure out what is this. I mean, somebody says, well, I remember reading this this text about a star rising over Israel. They couldn't do a Google search. They'd have to go through the scrolls and, and, and find it. It might have taken time. And it probably took them time to get the uh, materials they needed to travel. And, and so it's, you know, it, it takes some time to do this. But this, this shows us that the, uh, the Magi, were, they were not there at the nativity scene. This is probably a year, year and a half later. And, uh, but they at least know when he was born because they saw the star. And the implication is that the star appeared when Christ was born because at least Herod draws that conclusion when he tries to kill all the boys under two. There's another way you could know that they were not there at the manger scene. And if we read in Luke uh, chapter 2, verse 24, uh, Joseph and Mary, when Jesus is born, 40 days after that, they, they come to the temple to do the uh, purification sacrifice. When, when a child is born, uh, you're supposed to go to the temple. If it's a male child, 40 days after birth. If it's a female, I think it's 80 days after birth. And you're supposed to sacrifice a lamb and a pigeon or turtle dove. Okay? That's according to Old Testament law, according to Leviticus uh, chapter 12. Now, when Joseph and Mary came, they sacrificed two turtle doves. And that's even, that even makes it into some of the Christmas songs, right? So they sacrificed two turtle doves. Wait a minute. What, weren't they following biblical law? Aren't they supposed to sacrifice a lamb and a turtle dove? Well, according to biblical law, and this 
just shows how gracious and understanding God is. There was a provision where if you were too poor to sacrifice a lamb and a turtle dove, you could sacrifice two turtle doves. That's, you can read that. That's Leviticus uh, chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. And Joseph, being a righteous man, he would have certainly followed uh, God's law to the letter. And so because they were very poor, the implication is Joseph and Mary were poor at the time that Jesus was presented to the temple. That must have been before the Magi came because the Magi presented gifts of frankincense, myrrh, and gold. Yeah, if Joseph had gold, he'd have been plenty able to afford a lamb. That wouldn't have been a problem. So again, this, the Magi came later. So an interesting scenario there. Okay, so Herod then, he sent them to Bethlehem because he knows where the child is. They knew what time he was born, so they each get some information there and exchange that. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make careful search for the child. And when you found him, report to me that I too may come and worship him. And of course we know he's not sincere at all in that. He wants to kill him. But uh, he sends them to Bethlehem. They know, they know the location now. At least they know the town. They know Bethlehem. Okay? Herod gave them that information. And having heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star, the star which they had seen in the east, or at its rising, it's the same phrase, uh, went on before them until it came and stood over where the child was. So this is interesting. They, one of the, and this will help us to figure out what the object is, too, or at least what it's not. Because they, they've seen the star on at least two separate occasions. They saw it at its rising, okay? And that was before they met with Herod, because he, you know, he asks them when they saw it. Um, and then they, they see it again after they have met with the king. So they saw the star on at least two occasions. That, and that's separated by significant time. And that's, that's significant. So the star which they had seen at its rising, it went on before them. It went on before them. It seems like it moved ahead of them. And it stood over where the child was. Moved and then stopped over where Jesus was. Apparently the house. Because they already knew he was in Bethlehem. Right? They didn't need that information. They needed to know which house to go to. And apparently the star moved over the right, right house. That's the one thing the Christmas cards get right. Is I think the star was actually hovering over the uh, location of Christ. Because the, the text is pretty clear. And I've, I've consulted with some people who can read Greek better than I can. They say, yeah, it, it went ahead and stood over them. It's well translated. So the, the star seems to have moved, or at least apparently moved, relative to the other stars. And stood over where the child was. And that gave them that let them know exactly where to go. So, and this is interesting. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. That's kind of interesting. Why would they rejoice? It's not the first time they've seen it. But if, if, my, if my speculation is right, that they arrived in Jerusalem because the star was not guiding them at that time, um, they might have been a bit discouraged. I mean, if they'd made this trip of a thousand miles to bring gifts to the king of the Jews, and they think that God is with them, and that there's the star that's guiding them, and then it stops guiding them for whatever reason, string of clouds, arrive during the day, whatever, and they come to the capital city thinking, well, that's the place to start looking for the king of the Jews. The capital city would make sense, and they ask around. Nobody seems to know about it. They go to Herod, and Herod didn't know about the star at all. You could imagine that they might have been dis discouraged at this point. You can imagine they might have been thinking, is, is God really with us? Did, did, we, did we read the signs correctly? Did we interpret the, the scriptures correctly? Are we on the right track? If, that's, if that was their attitude, then when they saw the star again, you'd it would make sense for them to rejoice with exceedingly great joy. Oh, we are on the right track, and we're close. We're very close. Because again, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, six miles. You can do that in a day. That's not a problem. And they came into the house, not the nativity scene, they came into the house and saw the child, not the baby, the child with Mary, his mother. Uh, the, the Greek word for child there is kind of generic. It, it could include babies, but it can include older children as well. Jesus would probably have been a toddler at this point. So they saw him with uh, Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. I, I've always wondered how, how much knowledge of the gospel did they have? You know, because worship means to bow down. It can mean just bowing in respect. You might bow to an elder or something like that, but it can also refer to religious worship, which only God deserves, right? Only God's to be worshipped in that religious sense. But the fact that they fell down and worshipped him makes me think that it was religious worship, that they understood that this was not just the king of the Jews, but the king of kings and lord of lords. That's my suspicion. The text doesn't tell us what, you know, what, they, what was in their minds, but they did, we did, they did fall down and worship him. And opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
that was common. It was common to give to a king gifts like that, especially if, if a nation had been conquered. If, if the king was allowed to remain, he would pay tributes to the, to the king who conquered him. It's a way of saying, I'm king, but you're the king of kings. And so that seems to be what they're doing there. And in any case, this procedure was common. Genesis 43:11, uh, 11, uh, 1 Kings 10, 2, places where you bring gifts to the king. In Isaiah 60, verse 6, this was prophesied. Isaiah 60, verse 6, re uh, refers to Gentiles uh, that would bring gifts of gold and frankincense uh, to the king. It's interesting. So it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It might be a self-fulfilling prophecy because maybe the mage I knew about Isaiah 60, verse 6, and knew what they were supposed to bring. I don't know. But either way, it's cool that the, the Old Testament predicted that. Uh, gold is also mentioned in Psalm 72, verses 10 through 15, and uh, as, a, as a gift that you can bring to the king. So w now that we have kind of a, a better picture of what's going on here, a star that they saw when they were, when they were in the east, a, saw, a star that they saw that's rising, apparently rising over Israel, if indeed it's Numbers 24, 17, uh, then they would have recognized that as the Messiah star. They would have traveled to Israel, but apparently the star wasn't guiding them for a while. So they arrive in Jerusalem. They ask around. Nobody seems to know. They meet with King Herod. He doesn't know when the star happened, but he does give them some information. The child's in Bethlehem. So they go to Bethlehem, and when they're on their way, they see the star again. Very exciting. And then they get to meet uh, the young Jesus face to face. So what is the star then? The Greek term is aster. That's where we get the word astronomy, study of stars. And we gotta be careful of a, an error in reasoning called a semantic anachronism fallacy. That's where we assume that modern words mean exactly the same as ancient words. We gotta be careful about that. Uh, modern astronomers have a specific definition for a star, right? A luminous source that's, that's powered by fusion uh, nuclear fusion in the core and so on. That's not really what the Greek word means, although it would include that. Uh, the Greek word would include things like stars, what we would call stars, but it would also include planets. Planets are stars on the ancient system. Maybe you've been out at night and you're with a friend or something and you're like, wow, look at that bright star over there. And then some smart aleck says, that's not a star, that's a planet, right? Well, in the Greek system, planets are stars. They're stars that move. Planet means wanderer. The, uh, the ancients knew that most of the stars kept their positions relative to each other. The constellations don't change shape. But there were five stars that moved from one constellation to the next. And they called those wandering stars or planets. And so, and the, the, the five was all they knew at the time. They didn't realize Earth was a planet yet. So, and they hadn't discovered the outer ones. So planets would be counted as stars. Comets would be considered stars. Comets little, looks like a little puff ball. A hairy star, that's where it gets its, its comet means hairy, it's like a hairy star. Um, supernova, that's where a star blows itself to bits. Usually before the supernova, the star is too far away to be seen at all. And so when it blows itself to bits, it looks like a new star has come into existence. It's actually a star that's blowing up. But nova means new. So a supernova is a, a new star that would temporarily appear and then fade over a few months. A small moon. If, a, if there was a small moon besides the one that we already have, if there was a second moon that was orbiting relatively close to the Earth and had small size, it would be considered a star, a relatively fast-moving one. Or close conjunction. A conjunction is when one object in space passes another, usually a planet by a star, or sometimes a planet passing another planet. That's a conjunction. If you had a really close conjunction where the two objects overlapped, and that can happen, it's rare, but it can happen, uh, you might call that one star, okay? Now, I think if they're separated, nobody would call them a star. It's two stars. And every one of those has been proposed as the explanation for the Christmas star. And every one of those does not do what the text says the Christmas star did. Because none of those can go ahead of the Magi and stand over where the child was. None of them do that. Natural stars rise in the east and set in the west. And that's because Earth's rotating the other way. Uh, so they can't stand over any location. The only star that's permanently over one location on Earth is the North Star because it happens to be lined up with the rotation axis. So as the Earth rotates, it's, it stays over the same spot, right? But Bethlehem is not on the North Pole. So it, that, that would only work getting you to the North Pole, right? So that's not going to work. And, and by the way, that's a current phenomenon. The Earth's uh, axis shifts over centuries. And so at the time of Christ, there was no North Star. The star was there, but the Earth's axis was pointed in a different direction. So... It would, have not, it would not have been over Earth's North Pole. And the Earth's never had a South Star. It's just there's never been a bright star where the South Pole is pointed. 
So that's not going to work. Stars aren't going to work. Planets, they move, but they don't move fast enough to stay over one spot on the Earth as the Earth rotates. Planets don't move nearly fast enough to do that. So it's not going to be a planet. Comets, comets can temporarily move fairly quickly. When comet uh, Hyakutake came in 19, uh, 1996, it moved really quick. I was looking at the telescope, I could see it moving. It was pretty neat. But um, it can only do that for a short while until it's away from the Earth. It can't hover over a spot on the Earth for two years, where the Bethlehem star apparently did that, or nearly two years. A small moon. Now that's interesting, because a small moon could orbit around Earth, and if, you gave it, if it orbited at the right distance, it would orbit once every Earth rotation. And those of you that have a satellite dish, it's pointed at one direction in space, because we put a satellite up at a distance where the satellite will orbit once every 24 hours. And so the satellite hovers over a given spot on the Earth. Pretty neat. So a geostationary satellite would remain over one spot, but geostationary satellites orbit directly over Earth's equator. That's the only place they can orbit. If you put it in a higher latitude, um, the orbit has to go, the orbit has to be centered on Earth's center. So it would appear to go up and down and up and down. So, the only, so a geostationary satellite would not work because Bethlehem is not on the equator. So that's not going to work either. So a moon is not going to do it. A moon or a satellite is not going to do it. A close conjunction. This has been proposed. There is a, a lawyer who did a DVD on this project, and he showed that there's some close conjunctions that happen. There was one in 3 BC. He's, he's right about the dates. There was a conjunction in 3 BC of Jupiter and Regulus. And it was special because it was a triple conjunction. Uh, planets, what, as, you, as you watch them from one night to the next, they move in the sky. And every now and then, they'll stop and back up, and then stop and back up again and go forward again. Call that retrograde motion. All the outer planets do it, that little loop. And that's because that's when Earth is passing them. And so they appear to be moving backwards. It's kind of like, I used to run track, and I wasn't very good. So the person, on the, inside, the person on the inside track would pass me, and I'd feel like I'm going backwards because he's moving faster than I am. The outer planets do that because the Earth's on the inside track and passes them. They briefly appear to move backwards for a while. Well, it turns out in 3 BC, September 13th, Jupiter passed the star Regulus. That's a conjunction. And then it backed up and passed it again, and then it passed it a third time. Pretty neat, kind of made a little circle around, around Regulus. And that takes several months, so it's from 3, 3 BC into 2 BC. That's pretty neat, but the timing's wrong. We think Je Jesus was probably 4 or 5 BC, so this is a little bit too late. And the other thing is, it just doesn't, it doesn't do what the Bethlehem star did. It didn't go ahead of the Magi and stand over where the child was. It did a little loop-de-loop, -loop, right? But it, rised in the, it rose in the east, set in the west, like all natural stars, because it is a natural star. There was another conjunction, this time in 2 BC, on June 17th. Very nice conjunction of Venus and Jupiter. So Venus comes and passes Jupiter. And that happens every 13 months. It's pretty common. Uh, but the one on June 17th, 2 BC, was really good because they, they, they were very, very close. So close that they may well have looked like one object. That's pretty spectacular. That's pretty unusual. But it doesn't do what the Christmas star did. It doesn't move ahead of the Magi. It doesn't stand over where the Christ was. And by the way, it only happened once. Remember the information we learned earlier, the Magi saw the star at least twice. They saw it at its rising, and then they saw it again after they met with Herod. But the conjunction of Venus and Jupiter, that close conjunction only happened once. So see, that can't be it. It doesn't work. So, it seems to me that no known natural object can remain suspended over Bethlehem for two years. There's no known mechanism to do that. And so it may well have been a supernatural light that rose over Bethlehem at Christ's birth, remained there. Not particularly bright, but bright enough to be seen from Persia. And because of its unusual motion, the fact that it's hovering over Bethlehem, where no natural star does that, perhaps rising in the west and then standing over where the child was, the Magi would have recognized that as unusual. They would have known that no natural object does that. Now today, you can occasionally see a star rise in the west, because satellites do that, right? But before 1957, no one had seen a star rise in the west, except for maybe the Magi. And so that would have been highly unusual. But I am going to suggest it's a supernatural manifestation of God's power because there's no natural object that can do that. God normally uses natural means to accomplish his will. And so it's fair for us to look for a natural explanation first. But if there isn't any, we need to recognize God is not bound by natural laws, natural processes. And so I'm, I'm convinced that this was a supernatural manifestation of God's power.
And, uh, you know, people say, well, what, can you be more specific? Not really. I mean, that's, that's all the information the Bible gives us. We know what it's not. We know what it's not. It's not a planet. It's not a natural star. It's not a small moon. It's not a conjunction. None of those do what the text says this thing did. And so that tells me it's something very unusual. It's an unusual manifestation of God's power, which is the definition of supernatural. So people say, could it have been an angel? Sure. God could have made it. Angels are normally invisible, but God can give them temporary bodies to interact with people. He's done that. He could give them a luminous body for the purpose of illuminating the location. God could do that. Could it have been the very angels that the shepherds saw? Could have been. That's a possibility. After they met with the shepherds, they could have risen up and, and uh, led the Magi there. That's a possibility. Could it have been the Shekinah glory of God? That's a possibility. Could it have been an inanimate object? Could it have been like the pillar of fire that God used to guide the Israelites by? Yes, it could have been like that. But in any case, we know what it did, and we therefore know what it's not. We know it's not a natural object, because there's no natural object that can do that. But if I'm right in my conjecture that it rose over Israel, that would be the fulfillment of Numbers 2417. That explains how the Magi knew about it. It explains a lot of questions that people ask. Why did the Magi go west? Because they saw the star at its rising, and if it rose over Israel, it would have risen in the west. Israel is west of uh, Persia. So that would make sense for them to go that direction. They were just following the star. Uh, what made it unique? Uh, it, it rose over Israel. Numbers 24, 17. That's unique. No natural star. From Persia, no natural star would rise over Israel. They're setting over Israel because that's the West. Why did only the Magi recognize it? I, I don't think it was particularly bright, and therefore the, the average person might not have seen it, or they might have seen it and said, I don't remember a star being there, but they don't recognize the significance. Maybe they're not familiar with the, the prophecy. The Magi, being the scholars of the ancient world, they would have certainly known, if a star rose in the West, they would have known that is unusual. These were the astronomers of the ancient world, and if they had access to the text of Scripture, and I think they did, Numbers 24, 17, they would have recognized that, and it, they would have recognized it as his star, as his star. The Messiah's star is the one that rose out of Israel, which no natural star would do from the position of uh, Persia, and again, I think they're getting that from Numbers 24, 17, which says as much. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. And then how did they arrive at the right house? I think this is the one thing the Christmas cards get right. It stood over where, because the, the text says it stood over where the child was. And so they could have recognized that. They could have recognized, okay, we're not underneath it yet. We need to go a little more that way and so on. And by the way, you couldn't do that with one of the natural stars, right? You can't say I'm under Vega now, but now I'm not. <laughs> right? No, that's not going to work. So um, yeah, it would have to be something relatively close to the earth to be able to, to do that. And uh, so it was probably an atmospheric phenomenon rather than something that's really high up uh, in space. High enough to be seen from Persia, so the curvature of the earth there, you have to contend with that. So it, I do think it's a supernatural manifestation of God's power. Um, people sometimes have a misconception about what that is, though, because a lot of people think of supernatural as God intervening into a world that sort of works autonomously. And that's not biblical. The Bible says God upholds all things by the word of his power. God is constantly causing the universe to work the way it does. Supernatural is when he does it in an unusual way, in an extraordinary way, to accomplish a specific purpose. Uh, natural is the normal and consistent and predictable way that God upholds his creation and accomplishes his will. My point is that supernatural and natural are equally demonstrations of God's power. Supernatural and natural are equally manifestations of God's power. The atheist says, well, you know, if God would cause the sun not to rise tomorrow, then, you know, I'd be convinced. Actually, you should be, you should be convinced because the sun will rise tomorrow, right? Because that's what, we have a promise from God that it will, Genesis 8, 22. So there you go. God is the one that causes the universe to work in the way that it does. The fact that it obeys mathematical equations that we can discover. There's a, there was a wonderful article written by uh, Eugene Wigner. He was a Ph.D., a physicist and a Nobel Prize winner. The guy was brilliant, but apparently not a Christian because he wrote a wonderful article called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences, where he ponders this question, why is it the universe obeys math? And he can't come up with an answer. I can, because math is the way God thinks about numbers and it's God's mind that upholds the universe. Of course it'll obey math. See, the Christian can answer that. We can make these connections that the secularists can't. So, in any case, my conclusion is the star was a unique and supernatural manifestation of God's power, and that makes sense. There were a lot of miracles that were happening that were associated with uh, Christ's birth. The, in the incarnation itself was miraculous. 
Many of the things that Jesus did were miraculous, including his own resurrection. So that's not surprising for us. So I think one of the uh, lessons that we take from this, though, is that the people who should have been anticipating Christ's coming, the majority of them missed it. There were some shepherds who were faithful, but the majority of the Jews missed it. And it was Gentiles from a pagan nation that responded to the light that God gave them, and they got the honor of seeing the King of Kings in the flesh. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So uh, we have this presentation on DVD, His Star. And again, let me remind you of some of the other resources. I won't go through all these, but um, let's see. I do want to mention, well, Words of Creation. This, is, this takes you on a tour of the solar system from a, a biblical perspective. That's kind of a fun thing because we we've now sent spacecraft out to all the large objects in our solar system, all the planets, many of the moons. And uh, it's just wonderful, the information that we're getting back. It confirms biblical creation. Created Cosmos, this is the planetarium show I wrote for the Creation Museum up in Kentucky uh, years ago, and it uh, takes you on a tour of the universe. That's kind of fun. Uh, I mentioned dinosaurs previously. Secret Code of Creation, this one's unique. Uh, this shows that God has built beauty and complexity into an aspect of creation most people never even thought about. And there's no secular explanation for what you're going to see on there. And I challenge any critic to come up with an explanation for that. Make sense of it. And it's beautiful, too. In fact, we have that on Blu-ray as well because it was very, very pretty. And we have a book that goes along with that called Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation. You might leaf through that book. The pictures that you'll see there, as stunningly beautiful as they are, no human being drew those. those are, that's artwork of God. And there's no secular explanation for it. So that's a neat resource and one of our newer ones. Uh, again, we get the book pack for 20% uh, off, or the DVD pack for 20% off, or the library pack for 30% off, and the children's resources as well. We don't have the children's resources on the website right now, but, but you can get them here. And don't forget to sign up for our free monthly newsletter, and check us out on the web, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. I think we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back and uh, do some Q&A if you want to, if you want to come back and ask questions. Thank you very much. God bless.